What comes to your mind when you think of nuclear power generation? Perhaps you might think of more negative things than positive ones. Nuclear power is somewhat feared by people as it reminds them of nuclear bombs and radiation. Fish caught near nuclear power plants should not be consumed. People working in nuclear power plants are aliens emitting radiation. There are many negative rumors like these. Why do we hear these rumors? Maybe because people don't understand nuclear energy well. We tend to fear what we don't know. However, once we know the truth, such vague fears start to fade away. While preparing this video, I realized that I also had many misunderstandings. Throughout this video, I hope to enhance your understanding on nuclear power plants and clear up some of the misunderstandings you might have. Nuclear power plants generate electricity using nuclear energy. Then what exactly is nuclear energy? It refers to the power of atoms. Atoms are known to be the smallest units that make up matter. How can these tiny atoms produce such significant power? At one time, atoms were thought to be small spheres. However, through experiments, it was discovered that atoms consist of a nucleus and electrons. Subsequently, it was found that a nucleus is composed of protons and neutrons, which are called nucleons, meaning that they're particles that make up a nucleus. As smaller particles continued to be discovered, we began to wonder if there were other particles inside protons or neutrons. And within protons and neutrons, we eventually found a particle called a quark. It turns out that three quarks together form protons or neutrons. Three quarks are bound together to form nuclear particles by a powerful force known as the strong nuclear force. In our universe, there are four fundamental forces. Of these, gravity, electromagnetism, and the strong nuclear force can bind objects together. And strong nuclear force is the most powerful one, followed by electromagnetism and gravity. The Earth and the Moon are bound together by the force of gravity. The energy that binds them is called the nuclear binding energy. If we were to separate the Earth and the Moon infinitely far apart, they would break free from the influence of gravity and no longer stick together. At that point, if we measure the mass of the Earth and Moon separately, it would be heavier than when they were bound together. This is a counterintuitive result because it violates the law of conservation of mass. The reason for this mass difference lies in the nuclear binding energy that existed between the Earth and the Moon. When we move the Earth and the Moon apart, the binding energy that held them together is lost. But this energy doesn't just disappear. It's converted into mass, making the Earth and the Moon slightly heavier. You may have heard of Einstein's equation E equals mc squared before. Here, E represents energy and m represents mass. It means that energy and mass are interchangeable. In other words, energy can become mass and mass can become energy. The C represents the speed of light, 300,000 kilometers per second, which becomes a bigger value when squared. In other words, even a tiny mass can be converted into a tremendous amount of energy. Gravity is an important force in explaining a gigantic space like the universe. However, in a small-scale world of atoms, there exists a force much stronger than gravity. Atomic nucleus and electrons are bound together by electromagnetic force. Electromagnetic force is significantly stronger than gravity. How much stronger? Imagine a situation where there's a magnet on a table. When you bring another magnet close, they stick together. And when you lift one magnet, the other one on the table tags along. You wouldn't expect the attached magnets to repel each other due to gravity. This illustrates that electromagnetic force is much stronger than gravity. When calculating the electromagnetic force, gravity can easily be ignored because it is much weaker. If we move the atomic nucleus and electrons infinitely apart, the energy that held them together through the electromagnetic force would be converted into mass. As a result, the mass of the separated atomic nucleus and electrons increases. Since the electromagnetic force is much stronger than gravity, the gap becomes even greater. However, in a small-scale world, there exists a force even stronger than the electromagnetic force. 
It's called the strong nuclear force, which binds quarks together. This strong nuclear force is about 100 times stronger than the electromagnetic force. Quarks come together through the strong nuclear force to form protons or neutrons. When quarks combine to create a nucleus, they reach an equilibrium of forces, and the strong nuclear force no longer comes into play. However, as the nucleons gather, the equilibrium is disrupted, and the strong nuclear force comes into play once again to find a new balance. This force causes the nucleons to stick together, and it is also called the nuclear force as it acts between the nucleons. Protons repel each other as they are both charged positive. However, the nuclear force is much stronger than the electromagnetic force, allowing them to overcome this repulsion and stick together. The nuclear force acts only over an extremely short range and is significantly stronger than the electromagnetic force over such a short range. To overcome the repulsion and approach within such a short range, a harsh environment like the core of a star is necessary. In this environment, nucleons collide rapidly enough to prevent the repulsion, and the nuclear force causes them to bind together. Once these nucleons are bound together, they form a strong bond and possess a significant binding energy. When we break the bonds between these nucleons and measure their mass, the separated nucleons are heavier. This is because the binding energy between nucleons has been converted into mass. There are many elements on Earth. Each element has a different number of protons and neutrons, and there are differences in their binding energies. The binding energy possessed by each individual nucleus is called the binding energy per nucleon. The binding energy per nucleon is greatest for iron and decreases for elements smaller or larger than iron. Saying that the binding energy of each individual nucleus is significant means that it is strongly bound, indicating a stable state. Iron is the most stable element, and as a result, it is the most abundant substance on Earth. Elements smaller than iron tend to fuse together to obtain higher binding energy and become more stable. On the other hand, elements larger than iron aim to achieve more stability by undergoing nuclear fission. Elements like hydrogen, which are smaller than iron, have an increase in binding energy when they fuse together. As a result, their mass decreases after fusion. Conversely, elements like uranium, which are larger than iron, experience an increase in binding energy when they undergo fission, and their mass decreases accordingly. So two split elements are lighter than uranium. But where did the mass go? As explained earlier, the mass has been converted into energy and released. Mass is squared and multiplied by the speed of light which results in a release of a significant amount of energy even from a small mass. When uranium undergoes fission, it emits energy and releases electromagnetic waves in the form of radiation. This is because the split nucleus emits radiation in order to achieve stability. Just like humans, everything in this world has a characteristic of seeking stability. Imagine a ball on the ground. Unless something special happens, the ball will stay where it was. The state in which the ball is simply resting on the ground is called the ground state. Now let's throw the ball upwards. The ball gains energy and goes up in height. The state in which the ball has gained energy and is floating is called the excited state. The ball that has gone up seeks to come back down to the ground because the ground state is a stable state from the perspective of the ball. Similarly, when the electrons around the atomic nucleus gain energy, they tend to go to higher energy levels or excited states. However, these electrons prefer to come back down to the lower energy level, the ground state, and become more stable. So while emitting the energy acquired in the form of electromagnetic waves, the electrons come back down to the ground state. In a small-scale world of atoms, these emitted electromagnetic waves are called radiation. Radiation is emitted in various wavelengths, including visible light that we can see. So in fact, not all types of radiation are dangerous. When uranium undergoes fission, various types of radiation are emitted, and among them, radiation with high energy, such as gamma rays, is hazardous. When a neutron is shot into the nucleus of uranium, the incoming neutron enters the nucleus and makes the nucleus become excited. Energy in this excited state makes the nucleus unstable, making it oscillate, and eventually, as the repulsive forces between the protons become greater than the nuclear force, the nucleus splits. After nuclear fission, the two newly formed elements are also in an excited state. Gradually, they emit electromagnetic waves and come back to the ground state. 
The electromagnetic waves emitted at this time are high-energy radiation, like gamma rays. As for uranium, there are uranium-235 and uranium-238. Uranium-235 is composed of 92 protons and 143 neutrons, while uranium-238 is composed of 92 protons and 146 neutrons. Atoms with the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. As the atomic number increases, just like uranium in this case, the number of neutrons also increases. Among them, uranium-235 is used for nuclear fission. When a nucleus splits, not only do energy and radiation come out, but also two to three neutrons are emitted. As the atomic number increases, the ratio of neutrons in a nucleus also increases. When it splits into two to become an element smaller than uranium, the relative ratio of neutrons should decrease. Therefore, the split nucleus emits neutrons to stabilize itself. The released neutrons then collide with other uranium nuclei and induce nuclear fission, leading to a chain reaction. A significant amount of energy is released into this chain reaction. Uranium-238 is likely to undergo fission when colliding with very fast neutrons. The neutrons released during the fission are not fast enough to induce further fission in uranium-238, making it difficult for a chain reaction to occur. On the other hand, uranium-235 is more likely to split when absorbing very slow neutrons. So in the fission process, the speed of the emitted neutrons is reduced, and they are then collided with uranium-235. In nature, uranium mostly exists in the form of uranium-238, and uranium-235 accounts for only 0.7% of the total uranium. Therefore, for the purpose of nuclear power generation, uranium-235 is enriched to about 4-5% to before use. Enriched uranium is stored in small containers called pellets. These pellets are stacked together and are covered with long rods. And by connecting these rods, a nuclear reactor is created. The energy produced from the chain nuclear fission reactions inside the reactor is used to generate electricity. So, how do we make use of this energy? Let's take a brief look at the concept of nuclear power generation. Nuclear power plants can be divided into three main areas depending on the flow of water. Primary system, where a reactor heats water to produce steam. Secondary system, where the generated steam drives a turbine to produce electricity. Seawater system, where seawater cools down the steam, turning it back into water. Water flowing in these areas is designed to circulate, not to be intertwined with each other. First, we have a reactor where nuclear fuel is loaded. Uranium undergoes nuclear fission, releasing energy and heating the reactor coolant. The heated reactor coolant does not exit, but instead passes through pipes, heating more feed water. Here, the heated feed water turns into steam. This part, where heat exchange occurs, is called the steam generator. As the name suggests, it generates steam. The steam produced in the steam generator travels through pipes to the turbine. As the turbine rotates, it drives the generator, producing electricity. After the turbine is rotated, the steam is cooled down with cold seawater, turning it back into water. The seawater used to cool the steam also undergoes heat exchange without being mixed. The used seawater is sent back to the sea, and the condensed water is returned to the steam generator to be used again. Furthermore, there is a device called a pressurizer installed between the reactor and the steam generator, which increases the pressure of the water. So, this is a basic structure of a nuclear power plant. Located in the middle is a reactor containing nuclear fuel, and there are steam generators on both sides. Reactor coolant heated in the reactor enters the steam generator via pipes. As the hot reactor coolant moves through the pipes, it heats the feed water inside the steam generator, turning it into steam. The heat exchange occurs through U-tubes in the steam generator ensuring that the reactor coolant and feed water do not get mixed. The steam produced in the steam generator is sent to the turbine through pipes. The steam first rotates the high-pressure turbine and then goes on to rotate three low-pressure turbines. Steam is then condensed back into water using cold seawater. The condenser is involved in this process, which is used to restore water. Condensed water is sent back to the steam generator using pumps. The reactor and steam generator are connected to four pumps. 
The reactor coolant that has lost heat in the steam generator is sent back to the reactor using pumps. The reactor coolant entering the reactor becomes hot again as it passes through the nuclear fuel, and the hot reactor coolant enters the steam generator through the pump, repeating the heat exchange process. As reactor coolant that encounters the nuclear fuel is likely to be contaminated with radioactivity, it does not leave the system, but continues to circulate within. Feed water used to generate steam is only used in the processes of operating the steam generator and turbine. A pressurizer is installed at the back to increase water pressure. Even at temperatures of around 320 degrees Celsius, the water does not boil. Under normal atmospheric pressure, the water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. However, the boiling point of water changes with pressure. When you go up a high mountain, the pressure decreases and the water's boiling point also decreases. Conversely, with higher pressure, the boiling point of water increases. The pressurizer increases the water pressure to about 150 times the atmospheric pressure, preventing the water from boiling at a high temperature of 320 degrees Celsius. So far, we've briefly learned about the structure of a nuclear power plant. Now, let's take a detailed look at the structure and operating mechanism of a nuclear power plant using the latest type used in South Korea, the APR-1400. Inside a reactor building, there is a reactor in the center. Four pumps, two steam generators, and one pressurizer. Reactor coolant passes through the fuel rods inside the reactor, gradually becoming hotter. The heated reactor coolant moves through pipes to the steam generators. Inside the steam generators, the reactor coolant flows through U-shaped pipes, heating the feed water outside the pipes. The feed water outside the pipes turns into steam and travels through the pipes. The steam first rotates the high-pressure turbine. After rotating the high-pressure turbine, the steam loses energy and the temperature goes down. So it is then passed through a moisture separator reheater, which raises its temperature again, and it goes on to rotate the low-pressure turbine. After rotating the low-pressure turbine, the steam is cooled down to water with the help of seawater. Condensed water is then sent back to the steam generator using pumps. So far, we've learned about the basic principles and structure of nuclear power generation. In the following video, we will delve deeper into the structure and equipment of the nuclear power plant. We will also explore the efforts made to ensure the safety of the power plant and discuss potential future forms of power generation. Thanks for watching.